We have to preach the gospel in Hebrew in Israel now. They've never heard the Messiah in a way that shows his Jewishness. The Jewish people, reception of Jesus is intricately bound to his return. He is the Son of God. Are you embarrassed of the Messiah? To your Messiah, to your Son, let them see the beauty. Somebody who is dressed wearing a kippah or the tzitzit, it's just very encouraging. We are Jews ourselves, we are Israelis. In Hebrew, they will hear the gospel. Jews don't have to convert, they just have to believe. Is one, and we as Jews, we have to do what is right and holy in the eyes of Hashem. What did they prophesy? You can yell here on the streets, but what you need to do is get back to the original Bible. Cannot be that the Christian Bible is true and the Jewish scriptures are false. That can't be. Most of my work does not involve standing in front of audiences as I am right now. My life is dedicated to helping Jews in the church return back to the truth and the beauty of the Jewish faith. I've done this for more than 40 years. People ask me the question frequently, how did a nice Jewish boy like you from Borough Park, Brooklyn. You heard of it. You heard? Yeah. It's a new upcoming community. You heard about it. I don't know if it'll make it, not make it. How did you ever get involved in helping Jews in the church return back to the Jewish faith? So we're going to be spending a little time together this evening and tomorrow morning. I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I grew up in a very traditional Jewish home on Moitzi Shabbos and even like this. I remember I was 16 years old, and we did a very, we ended Shabbat in a very traditional way. We went to Moshe Peking. <laughs> it was after dinner, going back to find the car. As we were crossing Fifth Avenue and 47th Street, I could see young men, three young men, pasting up posters on the lampposts. And it said, come this Tuesday night to Jews for Jesus and learn more about your Jewish Messiah. And I was shocked. It was like a bomb went off inside of me. How is it possible? And I walked over to them and I began to argue with them. I'm sure there are many of you sitting here tonight who've seen these missionaries on the streets of New York Engage with them. It was a conversation that was going absolutely nowhere very quickly. And Mitten Drin, in the middle of this whole thing, there was a fellow, an elderly man, who was watching this spectacle. And he walked over to me, he grabbed my arm, he schlepped me away from them, and he said, Don't you argue with them. You don't know enough. If you want to do something here tonight to, to, to combat these missionaries, why don't you just follow them around? And as they paste up all their posters, well, you were there. <laughs> you slept them down. And I'm thinking, what are you talking about? I mean, I, I, went to, I, I learned in the Mir Yeshiva. We had a whole space station named after our Yeshiva. I don't know enough to argue with these fellows. 
I should be relegated to some kind of work, like pulling posters down. This would be my big contribution to the Jewish people. And I was very frustrated and walked away from that. The following, following spring, I visited Eretz Yisrael for the first time in my life. My uncle, Zechrein Levracha, lived in the old city of Yishlaim on Rechov Mizgav Ladach. First time in Eretz Yisrael. Took a taxi to the parking lot dragging my suitcases through the old city. And my uncle greets me in front of his home, and he was so excited, and he told me, by sheer chance, the last Shabbos, he had a very unusual guest at his home. Who did he have? My uncle was at a, a bookstore, Steinmetzky's bookstore, and he met a, a Swedish minister, invited him to spend the entire Shabbos at his home. When Shabbat was over, it's time for the minister to go. He wanted to show some gratitude for the hospitality that had been extended to him. And he gave my uncle a gift. This minister gave my uncle a present. What present do you think he gave my uncle? He gave him? Again, if someone else was there ready. Yes, he gave not just a New Testament, he gave him a King James Bible, not any King James Bible, a red letter edition. And he shows this off to me, says, give a look at this, give a look at this, like he had the manual from the other team. <laughs> and I told him that's exactly what I wanted to read. And I took it from him and I began to study it. I remember praying at the Western Wall a few days later. I was davening at the Kotel, thinking about my great-grandfather, after whom I was named, who was murdered in the spring of 1944. He couldn't be there. I was. I'm, you know, first time in Eretz show, first time in the Holy Land, praying at a place so holy, and I'm davening, and I'm just... I'm in a very, very special place. And suddenly I feel a tap on my shoulder. I turn around, there's a fellow standing there with a yarmulke on his head. You know the cardboard one with the staple they give out for free when you go down the ramp? That one. And he said, excuse me, do you know the Lord? <laughs> what am I doing here, playing handball? <laughs> what do, you, do I know the Lord? I said, of course I do. He said, you mean, you know who Yeshua is? And I said, of course I do. I went to Yeshiva with him. He was in my class. <laughs> I was thinking Yeshua Jacobowitz. <laughs> right there in front of the Western Wall began to unravel this cross-cultural communications problem. I spent two weeks studying with him in there to show return back to the United States where I continued to study with him and Baruch Hashem, this gentleman returned back to the truth and the beauty of the Jewish faith. 22 years ago, I want to say this to you, my dear brothers and sisters, to bring a Jew home from the church, the darkest place imaginable, inspire. More than two decades ago, I was shopping in Pathmark in Muncie, I don't think it's there anymore. <laughs> I had a bath mug on Route 59. And my wagon was filled with groceries, and I was placing them on the belt for the cashier to ring me up. There was a lot, a lot of stuff that was in there. And the fellow behind me, he, I could see he was a rough, clearly had a hat. And he's taking groceries out of my wagon and he's putting it on the belt for me. And I said, you don't have to do that. He said, Rabbi Singer. You don't remember me? I looked at him. Beard. From Jew. Who are you? How is that boy from Long Island? I'm a Rav here in Muncie now. 
Our people are coming home. Our people are coming home to Bailey Shalom. It's unbelievable. I remember getting a phone call from a mother hysterically crying. She was, she was changing the, the dust ruffle under her do, by her daughter's mattress, and she discovered a Christian Bible underneath her daughter's bed. And a fight breaks out in the kitchen, and only mothers and daughters are capable of. And she called me. Her rub told me to call me. And I explained that in order for me to help your daughter, I would need to meet with her. And we met in, in a Great Neck, New York. It's a very fancy place. I'd never been there before. Very fancy place. The house had its own zip code. It's a very nice area. <laughs> I sat down across the kitchen table from this young lady. She went to Boston University. She went to Boston University because her boyfriend was in medical school there in the six-year program at BU. She told me that when she moved into her room in the dorm room, as it turned out, her roommate was a born-again Christian, could tell from her name that she's Jewish, and gave her a Christian Bible as a present, as a gift. She said, I didn't really want such a thing. I didn't like such a thing. Made her uncomfortable. But she took it. Why? She didn't want to start in. She stuck with this girl for the whole semester. So she took it. She didn't read it. She put it aside. She said, two weeks into the semester, for a reason she does not know, she does not understand, her boyfriend broke up with her. And it shattered her life. She said that every dream she had was destroyed when he walked away from her. She was laying there in bed, crying her brains out. Her life was over. Everything was done. He said, Rabbi, I decided, I remembered that Christian Bible that I was given by my roommate. And I decided, maybe there's something in there that can help me at this very desperate moment. And I decided to open it and I began to read it. And she said that I found a verse in the Christian Bible, in the New Testament, in the Gospels. She, her words, those, the words in the book of Mark touched me so deeply. She knew that the New Testament had to be the word of God and Jesus had to be her Messiah. She knew it. I'm a little surprised to hear that. And I asked her, what Pusik? <laughs> I thought I read through it. I didn't know where... What Pusik in the New Testament was so moving, was so transformative that you went and she said, well, I'd love to read it to you. So she took the Bible, King James, and she turns a few pages and she begins to read to me from Mark chapter 12. And it goes like this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul and all your might. Oh, you read the New Testament. <laughs> this section here knows the New Testament backwards and forwards. <laughs> Never, this girl didn't know this comes from the sacred creed of our people, from the book of Deuteronomy, that every Jew says every single day, she never didn't know. She asked, isn't there anything true in this New Testament? I said, anything true in the New Testament is not new, and anything new isn't true. She was on an LL flight the following Tuesday and learning in Yerushalayim, and now lives in Silver Spring, Maryland, and returned back to the truth and the beauty of the Jewish people. That's what project, that's what inspire means. I remember speaking in Fairfax, Virginia. I'll end with this. Speaking in Fairfax, Virginia, for those who don't know this, Fairfax is a bedroom community for the capital. People live in Fairfax and work in the capital. Federal agents met one. He works for the Secret Service of the United States. He does not protect the president or his family. He trains agents how to detect counterfeit currency. Met him at a lecture they gave in his synagogue. 
And I asked them, how do you train agents? You must have a real fantastic collection of fake money that's been confiscated over the years, and the agents study it, and they can identify it right away. And he said, Rabbi, that is not the way we train our agents here. The way we train our agents how the tech counts for money is we show them real money. It's printed on a paper. There's no other paper like it in the world. There are shifting watermarks, fine line engravings. Agents study real money, real American currency. Why? Because you take an agent with that kind of training and dare, dare to put a counterfeit in his hand, he will know it immediately. Kindlech, my brothers and sisters, what am I saying to you? What's the message of Inspire? Am I saying to you that in order to protect yourselves and those that you love against missionaries who want to take your children away from you, maybe we should start training our kids in the book of Matthew. They should know the, the synoptic bomb. Gospels by heart. Maybe they should know all the letters of Paul, know the New Testament backwards and forwards. You are wasting your time. Know the real thing. Train your children, those that you love, in the Torah, in the Holy Torah, and then no missionary will ever be able to take a relationship with them from God away from them. Thank you. A good work to all of you. Adon Olam, בטרם כל יציר נברא, לעת נעשה בחפצו כל. אזי מלך, אזי מלך שמו נקרא, ואחרי כפלות הכל לבדו. אם לא כנועה, והוא היה 